Welcome to the Great Bass Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith, along with Brandon Flanagan from Freddy's Pizza Parlor. <laughs> no, I'm, say, I'm sorry. We're in Boynton Beach. We're at the FM Tennis Performance Center, beautiful place that Brandon and his partner, Allington, have put together. It's almost six months old now. Great guest tonight, Steve Denton. We've got to get on the phone. We'll have to have a part one, part two, because Steve's got a recruit to talk to. He's currently the coach at Texas A&M College Station, the main Texas a and He was very successful for a five-year period at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. But uh, for our listeners, um, certainly people uh, my age, even young Flanagan over here know Steve Denton. I was talking to Roger Crawford today. I mentioned we were interviewing Steve Denton tonight. Roger Crawford, what an amazing story. He's going to be our guest next week. But with, uh, he just said, I remember the serve. Uh, but he said he recently talked to Steve at an ITA coaches convention. But Steve, uh, September 5th, 1956, Jimmy Connors, September 2nd. He's four years younger than Jimmy Connors. He certainly could tell us uh, Jimmy Connors' story. 65, born in Kingsville, Texas, turned pro in 1978, retired in 1987. He's a Longhorn, even though now he coaches for the Aggies. Uh, people ask what color his underwear is. I think they say his underwear is still burn orange. <laughs> All-American, he's in the University Ring of Honor, which is a big deal. Um, number three in the his school history for career wins. This is something, prior to college, he won four high school state championships, 3A, small high school. I remember Dave Snyder interviewing or uh, introducing Steve when he was put in ITA Hall of Fame. I happened to be there. Dave Snyder was a coach at Texas for 28 years and said, uh, you know, Steve came from a small, everything was small, was small town, small high school, but he's a big guy. They used, Arthur Ashe, others used to call him the bull. Uh, so he, we have talked to him, played multiple sports, uh, basketball, baseball. I think being a pitcher had a lot to do with how big his serve was. As a pro, he earned over a million dollars, which is a substantial amount in his time. Number 11 in the world is singles, number two in doubles, seven singles finals. Uh, 20 doubles titles, reached, reached two Australian Open singles finals, won the U.S. Open doubles title. He reached three mixed doubles finals. He talks about playing with Billie Jean King where at a break point, to, at a key point in the match, he said no one ever gave him a dirty look like Billie Jean <laughs> did when he missed the return. Uh, had wins over people like uh, Wimbledon champion Stan Smith, John McEnroe, Boris Becker. Uh, again, known for his serve, uh, fastest serves in the world. Or the fastest serve, you're asking about, we'll have to ask him. Uh, he was at serve play at the same time as Roscoe Tanner. As a college coach, I mentioned 2001, he was at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. He's there five years. The team became top 20 in CA appearances, which is great for a small school. Then in 2006, he became the head coach at Texas A&M. Um, final four appearances. They produced more All-Americans in his first 10 years in the entire history of the program. Number of former players are on the tour. You asked about, uh, do I know Steve through uh, Austin Krychek, who we, you said you beat him in ping pong at age seven? Biggest win in my career. And I said, no, I've, I've known Steve. Uh, I, I knew Steve before Austin was born. But um, no, so many things we can ask him. Uh, but no, it's, let's shoot for a part one, part two on this. But um, he's somebody who uh, is very close to what we do. He hired, he's hired coaches that we've trained. Um, my first connection with Steve, I saw him play when he was 19 years old in Utica, New York. So that meant I was 21. I didn't really know very much about tennis. But very close to my grandfather's house, there was a tournament, and I remember hitchhiking over to watch it. But Vic Braden used to show Steve serve every week, during twice a week, during the, uh, the Monday through Friday program and the weekend program. But this has really blew me away. Steve's a great guy. Out of, out of nowhere, I mean, I know Steve Dent, famous guy, touring pro, he calls me up. And he wanted to know what we were doing to develop high school state champions. And he, he, he made that phone call when he was still on the tour. He hired coaches I trained. Um, he hired me to um, train him to teach tennis, which is a statement itself. Um, certainly a number of our students uh, and our student students have been part of the A&M program. So uh, many, many things. I remember at one point to... Uh, a&M was, they're still looking to have an indoor center built, and Steve was hoping to have an educational center there. I was flattered that he was talking to me about that. But let's call up Steve Denton, 
the bull, the big Steve Denton. All right. Excited for this one. Yeah. Now, if I can use my phone properly. Hello. Steve Denton. Yes, sir. Brandon Flanagan, Steve Smith. Great to have you as a guest. Thanks for uh, taking your time to talk to us. Hey, Steve. How you doing? Good. How about yourself? Great. Pleasure to meet you over the airwaves here. I know we've never met in person, but uh, really looking forward to tonight's conversation. So thanks for coming on. You're welcome. My pleasure. I know you, you have to talk to a, a, a recruit, uh, so I'll have this be part one, the, the story Steve Den, my story can be written on a piece of confetti, but uh, <laughs> not yours. Uh, why don't you start with Steve Denton's early years, starting out in tennis? How'd you get going in tennis? I know you played multiple sports. Yeah, um, I was. Uh, I grew up in a small town, Bristol, Texas, about 650 people, about 30 minutes from Corpus Christi, where at the time the ATB Tennis Center was rocking and rolling because we had. Uh, Bob Mapes is the director there and had University of Corpus Christi was one of the top teams in Division One at that time. Uh, and Mr. Mapes had so many good players on that team. And obviously I was a beneficiary of that. But I, I started taking lessons there. My, my cousin, Mark Reading, who was a tennis player until 18, we played doubles together. Uh, he moved to uh, Corpus Christi and started taking lessons. And as a result, I started taking lessons, too, with him at the HUB Tennis Center. Uh, Ron Woods was actually there part of that time, and then some of the really good players that played for UCC were there in the early years. And then, obviously, I took lessons, you know, some from Bob Mapes as well. Yeah, but Carlos Goffey, uh, he was a guest. He said that uh, he remembers you uh, being a teenager watching practice. Well, I, you know, again, I was a beneficiary of being out around a really good program uh, there. Uh, a lot of good players, uh, you know, back in way back when, I think uh, Tony Palafox played there uh, uh, for Bob Bates, who played Davis Cup from Mexico, Vicente Zarazua uh, from Mexico, Humphrey Jose and Jorge Andrew, who both played, uh, that were from Venezuela, um, Vicente and Roberto Chavez and and uh, those guys were from Mexico, obviously. And so, you know, there were a lot of good players around uh, that time. And uh, there were a lot of good teams in our area. You know, Trinity had the Bob McKinleys and the Paul Gherkins and Brian Godfrey's and Dick Stockton's on their team. And then Rice had a really good team with Harold Solomon and Mike Estep and Emilio Montano. So there were a lot of Zangari there were a lot of good teams in our area that came down. The Corpus was kind of one of the major hubs of tennis, and uh, I was obviously a beneficiary of being around that even at a really young age. I think exposure is it's great for uh, young players to see very good tennis played. Um, I was Billy Jean King says if if you want to be it, you got to see it. Mm-hmm. You got to see great well, players. Well, even early on, <clears throat> the handsome eight came came to town and I got to see Laver and and uh, you know Rosewall and all those guys came uh, and played uh, some of the top women. I think Billy Jean may have been there and uh, and Rosie Casals and a few of them as well. So you know they, they came there and then obviously I wasn't too far away from you know River Oaks and Houston where I could go up there and and uh, you know see that as well and that that made a big difference. In fact. Uh, in my high school days, uh, my last year of high school, I we, the NCAA championship was in Corpus Christi. Bob Mates had kind of be, begun a bit of this team tennis. It was still, you know, kind of individuals there for for, mo- for the most part. You know, each team got about four guys, and they counted points for the NCAA title. And uh, they had uh, they had the teams down in Corpus. Uh, uh, a couple times that I was actually the center service linesman for Billy Martin when he put beat George Hardy in five sets in the in the finals of the NCA one year. So you know, just a lot of a lot of uh, good memories, and obviously, I saw a lot of good tennis growing up, and that motivated me to you know try to get better. I remember uh, 
Scanlon, Billy Scanlon and Peter Fleming played a final that was played in Corpus. They did. One year, uh, one year was uh, George and uh, and Billy, and, and the next year was Peter and uh, and Billy Scanlon. And Billy Scanlon, you know, played for Bob McKinley. Uh, and so uh, when he was at Trinity as the coach, and so you know, there were some there were some really good uh, players in that area, and obviously in Texas, even before me. Um, you know, the, the guys out in West Texas were really, really good. The brother and sister combo. Uh, there, there was just a lot of, a lot of good, uh, Cliff Ritchie and his, and his, um, and his, uh, sister were both top players. So there were a lot, there was lots of good tennis growing up, uh, in my neck of the woods. Oh, the Southwest conference. Uh, amazing. You listed off so many people played in that conference. Uh, John Newcomb, I think he used to call the handsome eight, uh, the handsome seven plus Tony Roach. But uh, you, you, um, you had to, I mean, watching those guys, uh, they're obviously older than you, but you had a chance to play against the Rose Walls and the, the, the players from that group, but, right? Sure. I mean, kind of early in my career and later in theirs, uh, we overlapped a little bit. Um, Kind of a funny story. So I'm playing doubles in my first year on the tour with Mark Serpent. And uh, we're in the semifinals, I believe, of Hong Kong, maybe the quarterfinals. And we're playing John Newcomb and Ken Rosewall, who are, you know, two le- obviously great players and legends of the game. And, you know, they're a little longer in the tooth, but they're still, they're still really, really good. And so, you know, Newcomb had uh, a basically a chip backhand return from the deuce court and me full of scissorinkum thought, you know, I could go on that uh, pretty regularly. And so one point we're playing um, and I told Mark, I said, look, you know, I want you to serve to his backhand down the tee. I'm going to poach, uh, you know? And so sure enough, I, he, he kind of, he doesn't float it, but he hits it above net level. And I, I hit this, hard as I could volley right at Rosewall and before I'm even finished with my swing I hear this really loud thud on my chest and he had reflexed that backhand volley back onto my chest before I'd even finished my swing wow. uh, and kind of winked at me like you know stay on your side big fella you don't <laughs> oh, over here uh, messing with one of the, the great backhand volleys of all time I think probably in those days, probably the three best, uh, and I'm, I'm, pr- and I'm leaving some guys out, but just from that era, you know, Lou Hode, uh, Tony Rhodes, obviously Ken Rosewall, those guys uh, had amazing backhands, and uh, and it was great to be able to see those kind of guys uh, play early on in my career. With uh, two sisters, uh, did your sisters play sports? Um. Not- <laughs> My my middle sister, she uh, played the bass drum in the high school band, so she's pretty strong to be able to carry that thing around. Uh, neither one of them, as I kind of joke, they couldn't walk or chew gum at the same time, uh, but they were both really smart. So I guess I got all the athletic genes in the family. My mother uh, was an all-state basketball player back in the day where they played in three sections. Uh, there was an offense, defense, and a middle section uh, of the court. And uh, she was pretty feisty. She uh, was a good athlete. And then my dad was uh, probably good enough to play pro baseball. But at that time, there was no money in the baseball. So he got a job, you know, right out of high school. And then kind of when I came along, I, he said to me, look, I, I wanted the chance to play, but, you know, I didn't get a chance, so I'm going to give it to you. And as long as you, you know, work hard, uh, I won't put you to work in the summers. I'll let you work on, you know, the sports that you love. And we shared that passion our whole life together. That's great. Hi, uh, Father Claude, great guy. With um, what sports did you play growing up? Well, early on, I was a pitcher and a first baseman in baseball. Obviously, that was probably a pretty – a uh, helpful thing for my serve. Uh, you know, my dad had a pretty tough, hard job. And, 
you know, he'd get up early in the morning like people did then and worked all day. And then he'd come home at night and we would throw the football, kind of a ritual. We'd throw the football, we would throw the baseball around, and then we would shoot baskets. And I, I, uh, I didn't play football, but I played a lot of baseball growing up. Uh, in the little town that I lived in, I played little league. Of course, I was probably, I was in all the all-star stuff, but, uh, our, our high school didn't have high school baseball at that time. So I kind of gravitated to more basketball. And then as I started taking lessons, like I said, with my cousin Mark early on, I, I started enjoying the tennis. So I, I kind of played about five months a year for tennis and the rest of the year I played basketball. So you played basketball right through high school? I did. Yeah. I actually could have maybe played in college. I had a couple of pretty good offers. I I probably averaged about 18 points a game. And, uh, you know, I was a pretty good shot because I had a uh, – all the all the kids in our neighborhood came to my house every day after school and we played basketball, pick up basketball as a kid. And so, you know, a lot of reps there you get. Um uh, I remember one time in, in middle school, and I made 163 free throws in a row in our little gym. So I got pretty good uh, just because I spent a lot of time at it, just like the really good players do in other sports. And uh, and I enjoyed it a lot because it was a team sport. You know, I really enjoyed the team part of it. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why I really enjoyed doubles so much because it, obviously it's a team, and, and in your singles it's individual. and I enjoyed the team, obviously, in college as well, uh, just because I thought that was uh, a lot of fun to be able to share those experiences. You know, tennis is a pretty tough sport, as you know. You know, it's uh, kind of on your own, and uh, it's uh, it's not as easy maybe as some of these others because there's not the as much of the social aspect of it as there was in some of the others. And I always enjoyed the social part of uh, of playing basketball. You kept your basketball skills a secret with Ivan Lendl when he was the richest player in the world, correct? And you hustled him for a little money? <laughs> we had the same agent for a while. Uh, and we had, it was one of the years that I, you know, the, at the in those days, the final eight guys got into the Masters. It was at Madison Square Garden. And uh, Lendl and I were good friends. You know, everybody thought Lendl was real stoic, but, in those early days, he really just didn't know English that well or was comfortable with it. He was really funny, but most people didn't know it. He had a big sense of humor and mm. cut up all the time. So we had, uh, Kevin and I, Kevin Kern and I had gotten to the Masters. I think there were only four teams then. And then I had made the singles, and we had gone to Madison Square Garden, and they had set up a press conference at the Felt Forum, which they do a lot of boxing and other things in the smaller arena there in the garden. And so they set up all these booths for, you know, the top players for the media to talk to. Well, you know, of course, no one was talking with me. They were over with Borg and Connors and McEnroe. And Lindell wasn't getting much of action at that time either. So after a little while, I said, hey, why don't we go up to the garden and let's – uh Let's go play some basketball. And so we went up there, and Paul Westhead was the coach uh, for Chicago at the time. They had a guy named Reggie Theus, who was their star player. And they were practicing up there, and they'd kind of finished their practice or at the end of it. And so we went up there and asked him if we could, you know, kind of shoot some baskets on the other end. And, you know, Lindell's pretty competitive about everything. And they were going to play, uh, I think, the Knicks and the Bulls were going to play that night. And so Lindell being the competitor he is, and I kind of baited him. I knew he played basketball some because he had talked about it before. I hadn't really said a whole lot. And so we started playing horse and doing stuff like that. And I was winning and he didn't like that. And so uh, we ended up uh, going to half court. And uh, I think I said to him, I had practiced a lot as a kid, you know, shooting half court shots and stuff, as the kids like to do when they they're by themselves and they kind of count down to the buzzer, you know, making the winning shot and all that. And so, uh, anyway, I said uh, I'll 
I can't remember the amount, but I think it was a thousand dollars. I said, I'll bet you a thousand bucks. I can, you know, you give me three shots or whatever. I can't remember if it was three or five. I'll make one of these for mid court. By that time, you know, Reggie Smith and Paul Westhead and the Bulls had kind of gathered around because they were done with their practice. So I remember shooting the first one and it was pretty close. Mm -hmm. And then I made the second one. And of course, those guys went nuts. (laughs) Lendl was slamming the ball and, you know, acting like a baby. And, (laughs) And so I said to him, hold on, I still have three more shots. (laughs) <laughs> and I made up, up, and so he was furious. Wow. So he got so he got the ball and he bounced it over the top of the backboard in the old days the twenty four second light was behind the was right behind the backboard and he broke <laughs> he broke that light. Wow. And and of course they're playing a game that night and they didn't have another light back there. It wasn't the you know, the 24 second clocks that we have today, that light would go off or whatever at the time that the, the shot clock would go off. And so he broke the light. The garden people are all upset. We had to get out of there. And, uh, you know, he wasn't too pleased about that, uh, that I had kind of gotten to him in that particular, uh, in that particular instance. In fact, we had a deal. Uh, we, we practiced together a lot that if we could hit each other with the ball, then that was, you know, payment to the other person. And so, you know, Lindell had the biggest forehand in the game, but, but, uh, he had a hard time hitting with me because at the net, my hands were decent, you know, played a lot of doubles. And so he couldn't hit me that much. So, but when he'd come in, he wasn't quite as good there. And so I hit him, you know, somewhat. Uh, and then when we played matches, we had that same arrangement. And I remember one time, I think the prize money was maybe $2,500. Uh, and uh, he was playing with Billy Scanlon, and Kevin set him up. And I hit him a couple times, and I doubled my money just on hitting him a couple times in the match. So he was pretty upset about that as well. That's hilarious. That's funny. Steve, high school tennis. Tell us about that. You've... Uh... I read yeah, I played. Uh, I played high school tennis for the Bishop Badgers, and we uh, uh, we had a lady, uh, Linda Fowler, was our coach. She was really just kind of a not really. She loved tennis, but you know, more more of a, a chauffeur and you know, just taking care of us, making sure we chaperone. I guess is the right word. And so we go to play tournaments and. Uh, Again, I like the social part of that. Uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, but I played uh, throughout high school. And in Texas at that time, there were 4A, 3A, 2A, 1A, and, and Bishop was a 3A school. So all the top players, you know, in the state, most all of them were playing 4A. So I won state at 3A all four years, which there's only been one or two people that had done that in the in all the years. But I... I was playing against players that were not near as experienced as I was. And obviously I was getting to go and take lessons in Corpus and, and they were more truly high school tennis players where I was uh, uh, playing against a lot of the 4A people throughout the year, but just in the tournament, I got to play, you know, people maybe that I was, you know, had, had more experience against and ended up uh, winning the state championship in Texas four years. And so that was, you know, it was a big deal for the school, the little school that I went to. It was, it was nice, but I also knew deep down that, you know, most of the good players were, uh, were playing 4A. And had I been honest about it, I maybe could have won the state maybe once, uh, or twice at the most in the 4A and the, in the four years that I went to high school, if I would have been in that, if I'd have been at that level. Prior to going to Texas, or, or most of the players going to Texas had, more uh, national experience. You didn't play that much outside of Texas, correct? Coming up, I did. In fact, uh, uh, Coach Snyder at Texas did me a favor. Uh, we had a big tournament every year, uh, and I had, because of my birthday, I was already out of the juniors in my last year of high school. Uh, you know, in those days, uh, my birthday was in September. School started September first, 
and my birthday was after that date. So my parents basically kept me out another year till I was almost seven, or I was seven. So I was a little bigger and stronger, and it gave me an extra year. So my last year of high school, I was already in the men's, and so I was playing men's tournaments. Wasn't in the juniors. Uh, and I would do pretty well in Texas and maybe win a round or, or so, maybe Kalamazoo or lose first round. Uh, but I was only playing tennis about five months out of the year. About every time I would catch up with guys, I'd kind of go back to playing basketball. Um, and so, you know, I just didn't, wasn't getting the rep as some of these other guys were. And so I played a tournament in April, uh, called Buck Days, which was a pretty famous tournament in Texas. Um, and I played in the men's division and beat one of Coach Snyder's players in the, I don't know, semis or finals. Um, and, uh, so after that, uh, Coach, Bob Bates had said to Coach Snyder, hey, you know, he doesn't have the ranking or whatever, but I think he'd be pretty good if he goes to college because he's not playing that much. He's just playing four or five months out of the year. And uh, so Coach took a chance and gave me a scholarship uh, to come to Texas. And that was the first time that I played year-round when I went to college. Wow. Did you um, – I mean, with uh... – turning to tennis or choosing tennis over basketball? Did you do that with pro aspirations that you thought you could go further in tennis and basketball? I mean, how did you choose I, tennis? Yeah, I, I told a story the other day, and, and I remember Dean Smith had a guard named Phil Ford uh, who ran an offense called the Four Corners. He was real fast, and there was no shot clock in those days. And I was watching them one Saturday with my dad on the TV. And um, and I said to him, I said, you know, I said, I think I can score about 25 on him, but he's going to score 40 on me because he's just way faster than I am. Mm -hmm. And I just think that uh, that's not a sport that I can. And I wanted to, I love pro sports, all sports. Uh, I went to all the college basketball and pro basketball and football that I could go with with my dad. That's something we did together and the tennis and everything else that we could get our hands on in our area. Uh, and so we kind of talked about it and I just felt like that maybe I had a little better chance, even though I hadn't played full time, that maybe I could, you know, in a few years time, maybe could possibly play pro tennis, but I, I was pretty sure by that time when I was 17 or 18 at about 6'3 and, and 180 that I probably wasn't going to be able to play pro basketball, uh, and I really wanted to play a pro sport. Can, yeah, sure. Uh, can you think of any advantages to You said you didn't play year-round until you went to Texas. Can you think of any advantages from, from only playing four months out of the year prior to going to college? Well, obviously I was pretty fresh. I mean, uh, you know, I – I uh, I think there are a lot of similarities footwork-wise in basketball, especially playing defense. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very beneficial for a tennis player, uh, the reactions and all that. Um, and I think more than anything else, you know, I had this, I felt like that a lot of the, by the time I went to college, there were a lot of players that were kind of already somewhat peaking in their game. Right. And I wasn't even close. I mean, I was just kind of starting. So it was all new to me, and I was willing to work hard at it. Knew I had a lot of, uh, a, not a, a lot of room for improvement. And um, I think it, in some respects, I, I was a, even in basketball, as a younger player, I always wanted the ball in my hands at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many games I either made the last shot or made the play to, to the other guy to win the last shot because I just I wasn't afraid um, and I I enjoyed those moments you know those pressure moments and I knew somebody had to take kind of responsibility and and I think I learned that in the team sport of basketball and even when I got on the circuit when I wasn't as good as the other players they had a lot more reps than I had I just wasn't afraid and I really felt like that if my game could ever catch up the number of reps uh, that I could get 
it would catch up that that I maybe I could I could make it as a tennis player. I you know I had a really big game, so it was kind of a, in a lot of ways even against some of the top players, it was not in their hands; it was in my hands. Right, right. Because of my serve and how I attack uh, guys. I mean, I came in on first and second serves. If they hit a second serve short. I attacked it, so obviously I gave them no rhythm. And it didn't bother me to get past. It didn't bother me to, you know, make mistakes. Uh, I just kept coming. And I put a lot of pressure on guys, and I got better at it, obviously, as, as time went on and more consistent at it. And I think the biggest change for me was when I got on the circuit and I began, not only, I, I was a little shy as a kid, so I'd always, take a basket even when i came to the hgb tennis center we all met there in the morning to, to play the whole day just stayed right there at the courts and played all kinds of games but i served a lot because i didn't ask other people to hit or whatever and i think i developed that and then i served a lot on the tour you know uh, afterwards but i think the biggest improvement i made was a couple things though uh i did i i really worked a ton on my on the defensive side of things, meaning that I really worked a ton on my return, mm. and and my I was holding serve uh, comfortably in most matches, but I wasn't putting enough pressure on and breaking enough. And when I learned how to do that pretty well, that kind of changed things for me. Your father, he traveled quite a bit with you too, correct? I know he. Everybody really loved your dad. He's, it could very easily be in the background. No one would even notice. But how, how much? How many times did he go to Wimbledon with you, for example? Oh, quite a few times. My mom and my dad. Uh, they just enjoyed the experience. They you know they even when I played in college, they were always there. Uh, and uh, when the team came to Corpus Christi, the the whole team stayed at my house. Uh, my parents were very gracious and you know wanted to help and be involved you know some parents are a little more uh a little too involved but my dad was the type of guy that uh even on the tour the guys liked him so much they would invite him in the locker room which you know never would happen today a parent get invited in the locker room that would not work and uh and then coach Snyder would invite him a lot uh he was kind of his buddy my dad never you know asked why his son wasn't playing or didn't get involved in any of that stuff. He was just there supporting and and everybody could see that. And so he was easy going and everybody really liked him a lot um, and wanted to be around him. He was just, uh, he could sit in the locker room and just listen and kind of blend in. And and, and the guys really enjoyed being around. Steve, how about uh, Texas uh, coming from a small high school? Did it take you a while to uh, crack the lineup and climb the lineup? It did. Uh, you know, it was pretty funny. My my first year, um, Kevin Kern came in January because, you know, South Africans finish a semester later. So he came in January of, the, of that first year. And um, and so the the first semester, I roomed with Gary Clock, and then I ended up rooming with Kevin afterwards. Uh, Gary was from from Louisville, Kentucky, and was our number one player, lefty. that had a serve kind of like Roscoe Tanner, uh, really tricky lefty serve. I really attribute a lot of my success against lefties to him because I got to, you know, deal with it in practice for, for three years. And I learned how to handle his American twist serve and his out wide serve. And, and that really helped me a ton as I moved forward. But, uh, you know, Texas was a um, was a really good program at the time. We had a guy named Paul Avis who, you know, passed away way too young, but he played. Gary played number one that year, and and, uh, and I was not in the lineup per se. I was uh, kind of coming in, uh, and coach told me that that he was going to play senior uh, Dan Byfield. At number six, and Dan and I played number three doubles that year. He was a tall, lanky guy that had a big serve and big forehand, and uh, so we played together. 
but Dan kept winning. And so coach said to us, he said, Dan will start. He'll play until he loses. And when he loses, you come in. And so, anyway, I waited, I don't know, 12 or 13 matches in the season before he lost. He eventually lost, and then I came in, and I won, you know, I don't know, maybe a similar number. And we were playing in the Southwest Conference Tournament in the semifinals uh, against U of H. And I played a guy, actually, that I grew up with in Corpus Christi that was older than me and ended up losing uh, the decide. Uh, the match that ended up, we ended up losing the match to University of Houston. And I think that was in the, I can't remember if it was the semis or the finals of the, of the, of the uh, Southwest Conference Tournament. And so when I lost, that meant Dan got to go back in and play in the NCAA Tournament. And I didn't get to play the NCAAs that year because, uh, in singles, because it was his turn to go back in. So that was kind of, and Coach Snyder, pretty funny that year. You know, Kevin came over with a two-handed backhand. I'm sorry, a two-handed forehand and a one-handed slot backhand. And Coach didn't think he could play doubles <laughs> at the time. And so he didn't play much doubles uh, that first year. And he didn't get to play in the tournament because he had acted up in a tournament. And Coach was a pretty strong disciplinarian. And so he said, that's fine. You won't be playing the rest of the season because of the report I got from you acting up at a tournament. And so Kevin was ready to go back home. And to his father's credit, uh, Ron Curran, he made Kevin come back in his second year. Uh, so, you know, different times as, as – uh, as we could probably all attest to. I mentioned that as a change quite often where Kevin Curran played in the NCAA finals with a two-handed forehand, and then he played in the Wimbledon final with a one-handed forehand. He did. Um, yeah, and he, he, he... That was that was, Warren, that was Warren Jakes. I think, you know, he kind of... Warren had... Uh, you know, Warren came from Hoplin School, uh, and he was number nine in Australia, and all eight guys in front of him were Wimbledon champions. So he was a heck of a player. He got to the round of 16 of the U.S. Open and Wimbledon. And uh, he was working with Kevin and I. And I think he saw that Kevin could be really, really good, but that he could really only chip his backhand, couldn't really get over it. And that hand was causing that, you know, to do that. So he decided to take, you know, work in, into hitting a one-handed forehand so that he could begin to hit over his backhand. I think overall, as time went on, that uh, that one-handed backhand really became uh, a good weapon for Kevin. He returned well with it. He could, you know, guys could have, when they attacked him there, you know, he could slip passing shots by him, at least play it flat, you know, and not not have to come under it all the time. And so uh, the, the two-handed forehand was a major weapon, though. Anything in the middle of the court, the point was over. And so I wondered, always wondered, if if it would have been possible for him to keep that two-hander, especially on certain balls, uh, and uh, still be able to hit over his one-handed backhand. We never, it never, it never happened. But I, I had always wondered later what would have happened had he been able to learn how to hit, you know, get his grip over to hit his hit his uh, top spin backhand. Uh, or and flat back in as opposed to uh, and not take that two hands away from him. I think people forget that in 1985, uh, when Becker won at 17, won Wimbledon, that Curran beat McEnroe and Connors in the quarters and the semis. Yeah, killed him. He beat Edberg in the round of 16, and then and then beat those two guys in the. I mean, the scores uh, for a grass court, a fast grass court. For like one, four, and two, and three, two, and two. Wow. I mean, I mean, he killed him to and get Warren, to the punt. Warren Jakes worked with you and Curran and Billy Scanlon. You guys were based out of Texas? We were. We were. And he also worked a lot with Ann Smith, you know, early on as well, who was a heck of a player. And so she lived in Dallas. And uh, his original uh, student was Jade Louis who played at SMU, number one for SMU, was a women's national coach for the USTA for a long time. Uh, 
but he was a heck of a college player. Uh, played a little bit on the tour. I think he had some shoulder problems, but I know he played number one for SMU for several years. No, I remember, and, I remember when he worked with USTA. I remember watching him play, obviously, as a player. But, he, yeah, he was, uh, but, he was with USTA for I, a number I, of years. A similar type of player as Bill Scanlon, but just left-handed. I mean, very smooth play. Hit the ball real well, nicely. Uh, you know, just seemed that everything seemed pretty effortless for him. Go ahead, Brandon. Yeah, sorry to bounce around a little bit, but uh, a little while back you were talking about your four high school state championships. Um, I know that one problem that we've deal, deal, dealt with for many, many years is junior players always looking to play up. Uh, you'd mentioned that playing 3A, you played against a lot of players weaker than you. Was there was there anything that really gave you an advantage from getting all that match play against players that were say, you know, either substantially weaker than you or slightly weaker than you? Well, I mean, obviously, because of, of the style I played, you know, weaker players tend to hit the ball short. Mm. And obviously, I got a lot more reps at the style of play that I eventually would kind of u- utilize and gain a lot of confidence doing it, trying, you know, just by trial and error, what worked and what wouldn't work. And, you know, there's I, my, my personal feeling is in order to, be an attacking player, you have to have three things in your favor. Um, and I call them the three P's. The first thing I think that you, you have to be able to penetrate the court with the ball. And by doing that, you know, then you don't have to defend the whole space. If you can penetrate your ball, uh, the ball shoots through or skids through the court, obviously they have to hit up to you, which gives you an advantage when you're at the net. The second P is that you have to be in a stationary position on the same side of the ball to be able to pin that space, especially at the net. So you're always following your shot. And that stationary position is your split step. Uh, And a lot of players either don't split step or they split step at the wrong time. And so they get themselves in trouble. And then the third P is just the placement, you know, to be able to defend the court. And and I have always felt that you can cover the, what I call the power line or the long line of the court or more the late side or the down the line side, you might say. And then you can chase the angle line a little bit uh, because that ball can't be hit as hard. Mm -hmm. And if you can do those things, you can have a lot of success at the net. Uh, And obviously I think a lot of players today, because, they don't have those conditions in their favor when they come forward. They get passed and, or whatever. Maybe when they were younger, they were too small to defend the court and they got discouraged and they didn't keep coming. And yet, you know, all these players should be able to keep coming uh, and become all court players if they would uh, continue to hone that particular skill. I mean, it, with our college guys, even at present, we spend a ton of time on approach shots and volleys and um, and trying to, you know, work on the, pass, the two-shot passing shots off of that. And we, we spend a ton of time on those kind of skills because I think it's a lost art of um, two or three feet behind the baseline to, you know, being in a home base position halfway between the service line and the net. That space in the court, look at Wimbledon you see that grass is completely green now mm. in our day that was the burned part of the court that there was no grass because everybody was adept at playing in that part of the court and I think a lot of young players today are not adept at playing that section of the court and it's one of it's because they don't get the reps and they're not as confident and maybe they have a little bit too much too extreme a grip uh, all those kind of factors that they Tend to not want to come forward and try to finish at the net. Mm-hmm. With uh, our intro, I know I, that's I know that's music to your ears, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Both of us, yeah. With uh, our intro, I mentioned that it, when I worked for Vic Braid Monday through Friday, he would show your serve, and then on the weekend, he had a weekday program, weekend program, and you know he would go through all the, the positives from a biomechanical standpoint, but then. It, I was at the U.S. Open. I remember it was with Danny Cooper on the outside stairs at Louis Armstrong. There was a court that we could look down on, and you were playing Velas. 
I remember just the different types of serves you had. I remember telling Cooper, I go, that's unfair. You shouldn't be able to do that with a serve. Mm -hmm. But uh, did baseball help you as far as being able to have uh, such a variety with your serve as well, not just speed? I think so. I mean, I, as I said, I practiced it a lot too. So I tried to own all the different spots and own the different spins, you know, to be able to hit that. Uh, you know, I hit my second serve pretty aggressively, uh, you know, probably in the, in those days, even with a smaller racket than the, you know, one, 12 to 120 range. I mean, I was going for it, kind of like a, a Pete Sampras did with his second serve. Because I, you know, I think John Newcomb was the one that said, you know, you're only as good as your second serve. And so I really spent a lot of time with it. In fact, in a lot of practices, I would play with just my second serve so I could get more action, you know. Um, and uh, I think that practicing all that, all those years, being able to hit my spots and with the different variations and stuff really kind of made my serve really difficult to first of all to read uh because i had a pretty low toss and it was out in the court and it happened pretty quickly uh and so i think it made it harder to read and also to uh i could be pretty accurate with it and uh you know put guys in pretty bad spots uh, on the court there weren't a lot of great two-handed back ends uh in my day uh there was some it was starting to happen but you know a one-handed slice for the most part uh now i didn't face labor in his prime or i didn't face rosewall in his prime or lou hode or those guys but that slice back end uh was really kind of not much of a match for a you know 130 or 40 mile an hour serve i didn't think and I always felt like that a slice ball was pretty easy to volley too, because it kind of it didn't it didn't penetrate as much as obviously a dipping ball like the guys are able to do today. What's your What's your recall from playing Velas? I mean, he was uh, was I'm sorry, a contrast in styles. I remember that match um, with. Uh, I mean, I, I know you had wins over you know big time players, but what about playing someone like Velas who who hit so much top? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, him standing pretty far back, obviously, which opened up the wide serve, uh, you know, pretty comfortably for me. And I remember that match. I, I, uh, I kind of jumped on him early and won the first two sets. I don't think I lost my serve, but, uh, but maybe once until maybe the, it may have been, I can't remember if I lost my serve at the end of the, I thought, I thought I, uh, I lost my serve once in either the third or fourth set and then once in the fifth. Uh, that's all he did. That's all he broke me the whole day. And um, I won the first two sets, you know, one break each set. And uh, I can remember one specific point late in the fourth, maybe five all in the fourth set, up two sets to one. I had a, uh, I had a break, break point and, uh, you know, I kind of, he had a plan of, you know, hitting his little slider serve out wide on the act court. And I had already kind of made a plan there that if I got that certain shot, that I would, you know, go to his forehand, kind of keep it low because he had a pretty extreme grip. He hit up to me and I hit a slice backhand up the line that I thought was you know, kind of in the corner. And I don't know if you remember Velas's forearm or whatever, but he had this huge forearm kind of a la um, Rod Rocky. Laver. Yeah, Rocky Graciano. Yeah, Marciano. Yeah. Marciano. And, and I, anyway, I hit this slice really well, and he took a – he got there, and he hit a top spin cross-court lob that landed in both corners. <laughs> I mean, he couldn't have gone over there and placed it. And I had nightmares about that because I had uh, I'd beaten Gullickson both times, you know, who I would have played the next round. I'd beaten Macaro the week before and lost to Lendl in the ATP championship. So I was playing the best tennis of my life, serving great, moving well, attacking like crazy. And, and that match probably cost me a million bucks. And that one shot 
you know, he wouldn't have broken my serve. He'd only had really one look at my serve in the in the third set. And uh, anyway, he hit this shot. I end up losing the tiebreaker in the four, pretty close. And then he breaks me one time in the third. But it was just an absolute perfect play. I did the right thing. And sometimes you do the right thing and somebody has a response. And that would hurt. Because I would have, you know, I, I never broke the top 10 in singles. I was 11. And I stayed 11 for a while. I just, every time I do play a good tournament and the guys around me, whether it be Patchy or Noah or, um, you know, those kind of guys in my range, they would have a good tournament. And I never got in the top 10. And had I won that match and uh, beaten Gullickson, who I think I would have beaten the next round, uh, Vilas beat him pretty comfortably. Uh, then I would have uh, been in the semis against Connors, who I'd had match points against the last time I'd played him. Well, which which so, Gullickson was that, Tim or Tom? Uh, Tom, lefty. And so, uh, and I was good against lefties because of all that practice I got against Gary Plot. I beat Roscoe Tanner most every time, and I beat the Gullickson's, and I beat John McEnroe. You know, it was a pretty good lefty. Uh, the lefties didn't bother me. And so uh, I just, uh, you know, didn't quite get that one done because that was stunk because I was too touched to love against one of the best players in the world on, on Armstrong and uh, ended up losing, I think, 7 5, 7 6, 6 3, the last three sets. Well, there's one time, that Ma- one time that McEnroe bothered you. I remember calling you up and go, hey, Denton, have you read McEnroe's book? You, you made his book. <laughs> And we, you, you had him by the neck, and he put this in his autobiography. You had him by the neck, and Arthur Ashe was calling you bull, like everybody on the tour. And he must have bothered you. <laughs> what did Johnny Mac do to have you want to put his head, head in the toilet? Well, we had a little bit of a disagreement. You know, I'm <laughs> a Texas fella, and he's a New Yorker. And, you know, uh, so we were playing, I don't know, the quarters of semis of Wimbledon. Uh, one year in doubles, Peter and John were the best team on the planet, and they were, he was playing Kevin and I. And John was acting up on the court, um, and uh, so finally, I just kind of went over there and said, "I'll see you in the locker room after this is over." <laughs> and I followed him in there, and I don't know if I had him by the throat or not. That's probably a myth, but. But Ted Tingling, you know, the old famous guy yeah. that the design said that there was blood seeping from the gentleman's locker room at Wimbledon yesterday. And uh, so I had uh, I'd gone in the locker room and I was waiting for him and he kind of hid in the physio room for a while. He didn't come out. And uh, so I didn't, I don't know that there was as, as much of a, but I would have been happy to do it if I'd have had the opportunity that day and so Arthur was there you know and he was our Davis Cup captain obviously and put, John was his star and I was on the team and he said uh, you know Bull don't hurt him because you got, we got to play Davis Cup after Wimbledon and I said uh, I don't remember what I said but anyway uh, so we had I guess maybe Kevin had gotten hurt at Wimbledon and he didn't play in the summer. So I started playing that summer. I think that was 1982 uh, playing with Mark Edmondson. And we had some pretty good results. Uh, We beat, uh, uh, we beat John and, uh, and Peter in the finals of the Canadian tournament. I don't remember if it was Toronto or Montreal. I think it was Toronto that year. And so, I hadn't seen John since that incident, and he started acting up again during the match. And I finally just went over there and told Peter, I said, I don't know what's going to happen this match or whatever, but when this is over, I'm going to kick his ass. <laughs> and I'm going to get, I said to him, I said, I may get suspended for six months, but he won't play for a whole year when I'm done with <laughs> So I was pretty hot, and I typically didn't get that mad, but anyway. So then at one of the changeovers, Peter came over and tried to talk to me. 
And it was interesting because I think it didn't really shake up John. He he knew that that probably wasn't going to happen. But Peter was really shook, and he couldn't play at all after that. And we ended up winning the match. So the next week, so after the match, we're in the kind of the players area. They had, in those days, they didn't have locker rooms set up. So they had kind of tents for us there. We were back there, and um, and I had lost to, I think maybe I'd beaten Garlottis there and lost to B.J. Amitraj in the quarters, and then we won the double. And so we were trying to get some flight arrangements, and John, when I got there, was talking to Warren about, Jake, about kind of some flight arrangements from wherever we were, I think it was Toronto, to get to Cincinnati. And when I saw Warren talking to him, <laughs> I told Warren to not help that, you know what, with anything. And so I was still pretty hot. And uh, uh, so we go to we go to uh, Cincinnati the next week, and I have a good tournament in singles. That's before the U.S. Open that year. <laughs> and we we were playing. Uh, I think I maybe played Matt Mitchell first and beat him, who won the NCAA championship from Stanford. And uh, I may have beaten uh, Garlottis again, uh, maybe Tanner. So I had a pretty good run. So in the semis, I played John. And, uh, you know, he had a blister on his foot. He was having a little bit of a bad run. This was the semis. And anyway, uh, I ended up playing a really good match and beating him, I don't know, 6-4-7-6 or 7-6-6-4. And he's the number one guy in the world. And so I lose to Lendl in the final. And after that match, we ended up playing Davis Cup on the same team John and I did. And after we won the Davis Cup, you know, he kind of apologized. And we kind of made up and, you know, um, I think we maybe probably had a couple of drinks after we won or whatever the Davis Cup. And we kind of had our peace, you know, we, we, and I, I think part of it maybe was just the fact that, you know, there's a fraternity of those top players and they don't want anybody else necessarily in that fraternity. And I was kind of trying to stick my nose in there. And that may have been part of it. And part of it may have just been that his antics on the court that just rubbed me the wrong way or whatever. And so I was going to be the, uh, the policeman, I guess, of that. And uh, it was wrong on my part to do that, obviously. Um, but anyway, I was young and made some bad decisions too. So it wasn't just, uh, wasn't just his fault. Uh, so, but those were, those were definitely interesting times, that's for sure. I remember uh, Clark Gabner, Gravener, uh, Clark Gravener with Illy Nastasi pretty much doing the same thing because it can turn into some big time gamemanship. Tell the, tell the listeners about uh, Warren Jakes, your coach who uh, gave you a hard time for uh, barely beating Becker. Yeah, this is a story I've told a time or two uh, over the years. Uh, it led to, uh, it was in the spring of uh, 1985 where uh, Bill Scanlon and Kevin and I are all traveling and we play uh, a pro tournament in uh, in Atlanta at uh, at Georgia Tech. Uh, I think it was called Butler Arena, maybe. Uh, and we played this pro tournament there. And I remember I was ranked, you know, 11 or 12, Kevin 12, 11 or 12, and 13. We were all kind of right there together. And I played this young German named Boris Becker first round. Um, uh, and, you know, we didn't know a whole lot about him. He was the year before he was, uh, I think in the, maybe the third round of Wimbledon already. And he broke his ankle or hurt it really badly against Bill Scanlon and had to stop. So 
you know, he wasn't quite 18 yet. Uh, that was when he was 16, I believe. But this big, strong kid uh, from Germany. And so I'm playing him in the tournament, you know, pretty fast indoor tournament. I can't break his serve. And he can't break my serve. And we end up playing all the way through to a tiebreaker in the third set. And I, you know, I stomped him. I beat him like 8-6 or 9-7. So, you know, just killed it. <laughs> and I come off the court and relieve. Here I am. 25 or 26 years old at the prime of my tennis career and I almost lose to a, to a teenager and uh, I didn't get off the court far, very far where Warren just basically attacked me and he said you know you're so unprofessional and how in the world can this kid you know play you that closely and this and that I mean I took it for a minute or two and finally I just I was kind of taken back by it because usually, you know, after a match, you need a little time to blow off some steam before you talk to coaches or media or whatever. That's, uh, that's kind of why they give you a little bit of a break to allow you to collect your thoughts uh, a little bit. And said, I told him what I really thought. I, first, I said, have you been drinking up in the stands? You know, because he's an Australian, so it wouldn't be the first time that would have happened. And uh, that upset him I'm sure and I said I said I, I felt this guy's ball for the last three hours I said this kid's got a really heavy ball he's got a huge serve first and second serve and uh, I don't know what you were watching out there but this kid's really good and he told me you know a couple gave me a couple expletives and uh, and I said I tell you what I said this kid will win Wimbledon within the next two years is what I said to him. I said, this kid is really, really going to be good. And Terry Ack was already around already. And, you know, uh, he was representing him. So, so anyway, we go to, uh, we, after the match, uh, you know, Warren continues to give me a hard time. So we go to Queen before Wimbledon and I lose to Connors in the semis after having a couple of a match point or two. And Morris Becker beats him in the final. And Warren is just beside himself. He's so upset that no man in the locker room was going to stand up to this boy. Mm -hmm. He thought we were all a bunch of big babies. <laughs> and so he was just curious. So we go to, we go to Wimbledon. And um, at Wimbledon, Boris is on the side of the draw with all the clay court players. And he plays, uh, you know, a couple of guys. And he gets to Tim Mayotte in the round of 16, who was a good grass court player. And so Tim Mayotte, um, they're having a dog fight of a match. And sure enough, he sprains his ankle again. They're on one of the upper courts pretty badly. And so Terry Ack kind of comes out there and by, you know, by the time the physio gets up there, it's 10 or 15 minutes. And, you know, it's been a long time and they strap it up. Somehow, some way he gets through that match in four sets. Uh, he was ahead, but he was able to survive that match. Then, of course, the middle Sunday of Wimbledon, they give you a rest. It rained on Monday, so he had a couple days. And then in the quarters, I think he played Nystrom, and I'm now forgetting who he played the semis. But anyway, on the other side of that draw is Kevin Kern having the tournament of his life. As I said, he beat Edberg. I think he beat Edberg maybe 6-6-5, six, six, and five. so it was a pretty tight match. Uh, and Edberg was really young as well, but, you know, Obviously, was showing his grass court acumen at an early age. And then he killed Connors and Maxima. So Kevin's playing the best matches, matches of his life. And I, I hung around to practice with him. We, I think we lost in the semis to the doubles to the Gullickson, maybe. And uh, so I'm there, and he's just playing phenomenal tennis. And lo and behold, he's playing this young German in the finals of Wimbledon. And of course, I've made this proclamation that he was going to win Wimbledon in two years. 
and there's steam coming out of Warren's ears. Still, nobody has beaten this kid. How dare the players on the circuit let this kid get to the final? So, Kevin starts out nervously, as you might expect, his first and biggest chance to really, you know, win a major title as the favorite. He had been the favorite in those last two matches for certain, and now he's the favorite. And he plays a nervous first set, and then loses it, I think, one break. And I'm sitting with Warren in those wooden bleachers in the friends box, and Warren is trying to lift those wooden bleachers out of there, out, out of the floor, because he's just still livid that this kid is playing in the finals of Wimbledon, and that Kevin, his player, is getting ready to lose to him. And I'm sitting there not saying a word, uh, trying to, you know, support Kevin. And in the second set, Kevin kind of wakes up and breaks and uh, and then breaks to start the third. And I'm thinking, okay, now he's got it. He's going to win this. And Becker hits a lead cord to break him back and loses a tiebreaker in the third, Kevin does. And then Becker wins the fourth, diving around the court like you see in all the old pictures of how acrobatic he was on the grass. And so Becker beats Kevin in four sets. And we go to dinner and Kevin is, you know, distraught. And I know the the Last Supper was probably a very solemn affair with the Lord talking to his disciples before he, you know, before he was going to be crucified. And so that was pretty close, that dinner that night. We went to San Lorenzo Italian restaurant that we always like to go to. And Warren is drinking him up, his beer, and Kevin is just got his head down and realizes that that was the biggest opportunity he probably ever has to win a major. And I'm sitting over there just trying my best to not say, I told you so. <laughs> uh, and so, anyway, I never said anything. So, fast forward to quite a few years. Kevin has gets married and I tell this story and I make all the people ride, raise up their glasses. And then I finally said, I, uh, I think it's time for me to tell you that I told you so about the guy. I said, not only did he win Wimbledon within two months instead of two years, but he won six majors. So I think he was a pretty damn good tennis player. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, that's an amazing story. Steve, uh, tell us uh, your background. You're, with the Bible, you're a great student of the Bible. That started with your uh, upbringing, no doubt. Well, I, my my aunt, my mother's sister, went to non-denominational church in Houston, and my my uh, cousin Mark, who I alluded to, grew up in that same church. In fact, he's the head deacon of that church now. Um, and even when I was on the tour, I couldn't go, but I. I had a tape recorder there and I listened to tapes and it's always kind of been a part of, part of my life, uh, the faith part of it, um, as a Christian. And, um, you know, it's given me a lot of confidence and peace in my life. And, you know, while of course we all make a lot of mistakes, I, I take great solace in, in people like the, the great King David, you know, who, uh, if you know the story in the Bible about him, it's actually a pretty amazing story. But, you know, he he was supposed to go to war. He didn't go to war, so he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he saw Bathsheba, and she was the wife of his top general. And so he she was he was the king, so she didn't have a choice. And uh, she got pregnant, and he tried to covered up by bringing the general back from the war because you weren't supposed to go back until the peace had already been uh, acquired and, and the honorable guy wouldn't go home and sleep with his wife so David was not off the hook so basically he had to get the general back out and he put him out in the front and, and had his troops retreat so he killed him and there's this verse in the Bible that I've always thought was pretty amazing no one loved god more than david and uh, king david and yet look what he did i mean he there's 
some that said he probably raped Bathsheba, and some that said that he certainly killed him. And that's the enigma that all of them are in heaven now, dealing with each other, Uriah, David, and Bathsheba. And everybody in the world knows what happened. And if God can be gracious to someone like David and provide for him and protect him even after that fact, because David recovered from that, a lot of people would say, well, the guy really never was a Christian or whatever. He never really believed in anything. But the Bible's real clear that they are. So if someone like him can do all those things uh, and still have a remarkable life, then and I have a pretty good chance, I think, uh, in, in recognizing that, you know, God's been very gracious to me and, and given me great blessings in this life. And had I've had great people around me to teach me. Uh, you know, Steve, you came and were very gracious and spent a lot of time with me as a young teaching pro. I mean, I didn't know anything about being a teaching pro. I knew about being a pro tennis player, but those were not the same thing. So you were gracious to me. Coach Snyder was very gracious to me. And Warren Jakes was as well. I had a lot of great mentors. Bill Glaves at Houston, who was a, a, a great coach in his day. I just had a lot of people, Coach Snyder, around me that, that kind of helped me, uh, not just in the tennis, but also in the other. And then I had this Bible side of me where I really loved learning about it. There's a lot of military illustrations in it, which I love, and uh, and uh, it's just been a part of my life, my whole life. And so, uh, you know, I've tried to impart some of that to some of my young players, because obviously there's, there's a lot more to life, I think, than just tennis. And to be, become a honorable person, uh, and it may take a while to become one, but uh, it's certainly a, a very important part of my life, and I try to live my life like that and not just you know in saying it but in, in living it toward these boys so that i can be a you know an example for them of how they need to live their lives oh that's so well put uh, for our listeners we uh we referenced don meyer the late don meyer the basketball coach uh there's so many uh biblical lessons that can apply to tennis in life go ahead brandon no, I'd love to talk a little more about, you know, uh, we could talk probably all night about your playing career also, and I've got a few questions there, but just kind of leading into, um, you know, uh, how you speak to your players and what you emphasize with your with your players. I'd love to talk a little bit more about the beginnings of your coaching career um, and then how you ultimately found that college tennis was, was the right fit for you, because you've been doing that now for, for many, many years. Bye. Well, you know, a lot of players on the tour, um, it's a kind of a hard, you know, on tour, you're kind of put on a pedestal. It's really not a real world. And once uh, the crowd stops and, uh, you know, your career is over, then you need to find something that you're passionate about that you can, uh, you know, kind of give back. And, and I knew sports, you know, best. Uh, I thought about being an agent, actually, uh, but then I realized that uh, that was probably not the right thing for me uh, at a pretty early, early time after my career finished. Didn't you work for? Uh, for excuse me, you're interrupting, but didn't you work for Borg uh, Borg Management Group for a year? I did. I, I spent a I spent a year over in Asia uh, working uh, with Bjorn Borg's company called Bjorn Borg Sports Management. Uh, it was run with a by an IMG guy at the time that was from Japan, and I spent a fair amount of time over there. I had two good players that I was working with, a number one Japanese junior, and then a boy from the Philippines ended up playing at LSU, who was a good player. Uh, and I coached the Davis Cup team in the Philippines for a short time and did uh, the commentating for the Fire and Ice Tour that Bo- Borg and McEnroe did when they went to Asia, it's kind of like a, uh, an album. When you, when you put out an album or a new album or CD now, uh, you know, you, you do a tour beforehand promoting it. And Borg had, 
had gotten a company uh, in Italy to to uh, do a line of yarn board clothing, and uh, they were in Italy, uh, really nicely done stuff. And he was trying to promote his clothing line, and they were doing all these exhibitions in Europe. Unfortunately, I think he lost a bunch of money doing that. Uh, I think a businessman maybe in Sweden may have taken advantage of him, if not being a, a savvy businessman and someone using his name kind of hurt him and it ended up, he ended up losing a lot of money. I don't think those flows that he had in those factories really ever got out in the fashion that he wanted them. And I think he, he took a pretty big uh, bath in that situation. Um, and so, I was over there, um, you know, kind of helping out, did a little bit of the commentating, and then also was working with some of these young Asian kids that he was also supporting. And then that kind of fell through when he, when his company kind of fell through. And so then I came back to the States um, after that, and then kind of decided maybe that I would go back to Corpus Christi and help Bob Mates and kind of go back to my roots. Um, which is what I did first and kind of started, I was an assistant for him for a while. And then I, uh, then he turned it over to me and we had a little, uh, academy out of there. And then the A&M Corpus Christi team came, uh, initially I didn't get the job because I hadn't completed my degree. So I had to go back to uh, college to finish my degree while I was the, the director of tennis there at the HB tennis center. And then, because of that, I was I was able to start coaching in Corpus Christi, and I did that for a few years before uh, Texas A&M uh, came calling and asked me to come up there. Go ahead, Brandon. And and since then, what have you really enjoyed about being a college tennis coach? Well, first of all, it's uh, just a great uh, level. You know, of, I, I've always enjoyed the team part, so. I think the biggest hurdle is to try to get these young players who are from an individual sport and put them on a team and think that there's something, you know, bigger than themselves kind of, you know, there are a lot of great qualities that a tennis player has as a person, you know, self-discipline, uh, problem solving skills, dealing with adversity, uh, being clutch or, you know, being able to do well under pressure. Uh, just the concentration part of it, the, the courage kind of required. But there's one aspect of tennis that I think is a negative, and that's and, and it's 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 necessary, but it's the selfishness part of it. Uh, you gotta you gotta eat at a certain time. You gotta uh, you gotta practice at a certain time. It's all about kind of you and you know, as a young player, and so that is something that I think. Is that can potentially be a detriment to a team is someone that's selfish. So to kind of mold these young guys and to get them to become a member of a team of something that is bigger than themselves, I think is a is an important uh, aspect of this. Uh, and once they buy into that, you know, they really, you know, they really can enjoy it. You know, it's just like uh, I use the illustration uh, in marriage. Um, you know, I think if a young man decides that he wants to get married and he kind of thinks, what am I going to get out of this? That's the wrong thing to be thinking. I think what you need to be thinking is what can I contribute to this relationship? And then you have a great chance for it to work because as you know, you know, women can, uh, either respond to you or react to you depending on how you treat them. And so, uh, I think we've all had that experience. Uh, and so these young men, if they do the same thing, if they come into your program thinking what they're going to get out of it, instead of thinking what they can contribute, it's just a different mentality. It's a, it's a really kind of a, a, a lack of a better way of saying it, kind of a, a humility about people. And I think that's uh, what's required to be on a team is, is it's, there's something bigger than you, something more important than you. And so you kind of have to get over yourself a little bit. And I've really enjoyed that aspect of it. 
in trying to help young players understand that concept and uh, understand that they're actually going to do better if they if they believe that themselves and it's going to help them in their life afterwards uh, and be successful. And so that's one aspect of it, I think. And then I just enjoyed the level. You know, they're at such a uh, still an awkward age. Uh, there's still a lot of growing to do uh, mentally and physically. Um, and, uh, you know, we got a lot, you know, quite a few guys out playing pro tennis. And I think that we do things a little differently than some of these other schools uh, that uh, gives us that kind of advantage and obviously i look at it in a different lens coming from the, the pro level but also having the, co- the great college experience as well which you know to this day and we haven't said that yet we haven't talked about my college days but to this day uh my greatest experiences and, and i know that may sound you know kind of shocking to some of your viewers or whatever but my great experience in my college it was my college time with my with my teammates, mm. even more so than than uh, playing Davis Cup in the United States or or playing uh, playing at Wimbledon or the U.S. Open or the Australian Open or whatever uh, that team chemistry team bond that you had with my teammates in college was the most fun time of my of my tennis career. Mm. So I know, we know that you have a, a a conversation with a recruit tonight when you're when you're speaking to recruits. And not that we expect you to give any, any uh, trade secrets away, but um, is there any particular question or behavior that you study when you're trying to vet your recruits for someone who might be a little too selfish in regards to uh, how tennis players can be? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a couple different factors. You know, you asked me kind of, and I don't mind sharing this because I think young coaches need to, to hear this, but um uh, I look at several things. I mean, obviously, I look at someone that can be able to handle adversity, mm. that you know, good problem solver. Uh, as I'm watching him play, uh, I, I I look to see you know how how clutch they are. You know, important moments do they do they seem to rise to the occasion, or are they are they or are, are they just the opposite? Um, I also look at uh, you know their their swing. I think by the time the kids are 18 years old, and you know Steve may disagree with me a little bit, but they have have had a lot of reps. It's pretty difficult, I think, to do major surgery on swing when guys are a little older. I mean, yes, you can, but I think it's harder, mm. and they have to be really mentally tough to be able to deal with kind of starting over from scratch and being terrible at something for the period of time to take that step or two back before they go forward. And a lot of players just, can't, you know, and certainly today, I, I don't think they can handle that very well. I mean, I don't think they handle adversity very well to begin with. Um, and then when you put that onto them, uh, so I, I look at players that I think are pretty clean swing, you know, I mean, they don't have any major flaws in their swing. Uh, they, you know, I prefer to not have to do major surgery. I'd like to be able to put band-aids on them and then kind of help them learn how to play the game because I think a lot of them don't know how to tactically, strategically play the game very well. They don't play very smart. Um, and so I I think that, that those are some of the things that I, I'm looking for. And, and I'm also looking at their interaction with the people around them, and their parents, and, you know, how they treat the the waiter at the at the restaurant, mm. uh, and those types of things are clues that I can tell you that you know red flags go up uh, when I see people when I see young players treating their you know treating their parents badly or uh, in, in my presence or being disrespectful to people because they're maybe in a not being disrespectful because they're in a in a kind of a servant position at that moment and uh and so those are some of the things that i kind of look at because you know character is a really important part of a team and if you got one or two bad actors you know it could really have a adverse effect on the whole group mm. 
No, I mean, the changing of strokes. Um, talking to Chris Clore today, uh, two 12-year-olds, and if they both have had uh, five years, four or five years of, you know, developing uh, basically bad technique, you just need one major, healthy, massive work ethic. Um, but no, when, someone, when someone's 18 years old and they go on a college campus and then they're away from their parents and the academic load, it's, I think it's just obviously been proven through brain research. It's so difficult to change. Make changes. Yeah, I think certainly at that age you're talking about, Steve, I agree. I mean, that's way early enough to, you know, make major adjustments. I, as, a, as they just get older and they've played a lot and they're rep, you know, I, it's just a very different, you know, there's a couple of things that go together. I think that if you have a player that is a little bit weak mentally and they have a flaw in their game, boy, they will, you know, they'll crater under pressure, I think. Uh, so, you, you know, you try to avoid, I do try to avoid players like that, you know, from being on my team, because if they already have, pretty flawed swings and they're not very tough mentally even though they may be a great athlete uh i'm not sure that you can they can overcome that and they end up you know really not helping you that much because they fall apart under pressure and obviously with a a a faulty swing in whatever area that falls apart it's just like baseball you know if you got a weak outfielder it sure is it sure seems more than uh, coincidence that the ball always finds that person in an important moment in the game. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, obviously as a, as a tennis coach, it's pretty easy to, to look at player swings and know exactly where you need to be going on important moments uh, in pretty, in pretty quick fashion. With uh, of course, you know, power five school like A&M SEC, maybe the, arguably the toughest conference, but there's almost 5,000 colleges. So, there are a number of places that people can play. We have an 18-year-old here from Japan, and, you know, the art and science, he just got here, and, uh, you know, he beat a boy from Quebec who's pretty good today, 2-1, and one, and he was sent to us by Taki Marita, who spent time with us, and he played at Rice. But I think also how you present it. So he's got a reset swing on the backhand, for example. It takes racket low, so it's low, high, low. It's not wrong. I mean, Borg did that. And as you know, he had to stand behind the baseline on the return. But I think so many times, uh, you know, I talked to Brandon, he's down, been down in the South Florida area for going on 15 years. And, you know, dealing with local students, for me, I have a pretty captive audience because they've been told to come and see me and they get off an airplane. So that that way we can make it pretty simple, you know, where it's like, you know, you just tell a tell kid, just make your backhand a circle. You know, you don't have to get into paralysis by analysis. But too many times in the tennis world, uh, the grassroots level, when you're dealing with people that live five miles down the road, I find that you have to be too persuasive and therefore, you know, so much verbiage just trying to explain that, uh, you know, the shape of your swing should match the shape of the court. If someone has a too big a backswing, they break the plane, it's going to be very difficult. Just talking to Matt Clore about that earlier today, coach of the USTA who you know well. Actually, I remember having conversations with you about Matt possibly working for you at one time. But there's just certain certain holes that if someone's got a huge backswing, it's going to be pretty tough for him to play a downline approach shot. Um, could you do this? Could you talk a little bit? We're going to run out of time here, but we'll have to have you on another time. Talk about Bobby McKinley. Listeners need to know about Bobby McKinley. McKinley, <laughs> McKinley fan. Bobby McKinley, what a, what a warrior he is. Yeah. Uh, uh, great player. You know, he played when I was growing up. He was at Trinity. Uh, he's the younger brother of Chuck McKinley, who won Wimbledon. And, you know, he left us a little too early. He had, uh, you know, serious health issues in his 40s. And Bob, you know, grew up, I think he was nine years younger than his older brother Chuck. And uh, Bob won Kalamazoo and then went to the U.S. Open as the wild card, won a couple rounds, and then went to college. That would never happen now, obviously. Mm. Uh, he uh, was a fierce competitor, grew up in St. Louis uh, with Jimmy Connor. And so one year, uh, the story was is that 
Bob and Jimmy played a bunch of times in the juniors, and Bob always won. And I think he beat them maybe 16 or 17 times in a row. Uh, and, you know, that would be a shock for most people to realize that this kid was, that Bob McKinley was that kind of competitor and that good, but he was. And uh, so the story was that one time Bob was in New York and, you know, the USTA puts on their uh, convention and stuff. And Jimmy came, you know, in to talk to him, all the teaching pros, USTA, comes in the room kind of in his brash, you know, voice or whatever and says, I'll challenge any of you guys in here to a game, except for that guy right there. And he pointed to Bob. And, of course, Bob got red in the face, probably embarrassed, but, but Bob had beaten him so much as a kid. Actually, there's and, a famous story where uh, Bobby McKinley beat Jimmy where he drop shot, and they were, you know, really young. He's yeah. hitting drop shots and lobs and drop shots and lobs. And Gloria. Uh, Gloria. Yeah. Story. Yeah, go ahead. Gloria, Gloria told him, you know, we'll go. You will never. She got right up in Bob's face. They were probably, he was probably about 16 years old. You will never beat Jimbo again like that. You know, we'll go back and we'll hit X number of overheads and drop shots. You know, you will never beat him like that again. <laughs> and that's where he learned that sky hook. Wow. You know, he had when he played. <laughs> and Bob never lost to him until I think the quarters of the NCAA championships at Notre Dame back when they, and it cost Trinity the title that year. UCLA ended up winning it because Bob lost, finally lost to Jimmy uh, when Jimmy was in college <laughs> as a freshman at UCLA. So, uh, so but Bobby, he uh, he's in the Hall of Fame as a player and as a coach. Um, how about Chuck? Yeah. Did you, I know Chuck uh, was much older. Did you, have a, did you have the opportunity to see Chuck play? No, not really, but I do. Bob told me he wasn't very tall, kind of like Bob was not very tall. But that he could dunk the basketball, I mean, that he was that good an athlete. Yeah. And I had heard that before, that he was a little bigger than Bob, but just a great athlete. Um, and uh, obviously had a lot of success in a short period of time. Well, I think maybe maybe 1959 or 1960 is when he maybe won Wimbledon. Um, and, uh, but Bob always talked about him, how you know great a player he was how tough he was. And, uh, you know, then I, I got the job at A&M in uh, 2006. And the first person that Bob was running the Duke and Tennis Academy for John in New Bronzeville, Texas. So I asked Bob, and, and I, Bob had been talking with Tim Cass, who was a coach here at A&M before, before I got here. Tim left to go back to his alma mater in New Mexico to be administrator, kind of as, going in that direction with his career. And so I, he had talked to Bob about coming over and helping him as an assistant. And uh, at least they'd had a little couple of conversations. So when I got the job, I actually called Bob and he came down to Corpus and we met at a restaurant and we talked. And I had found out that his daughter uh, was going to vet school. You know, A&M has one of the, if not the best, the top, vet schools in the country and one of his daughters was had gotten into the vet school so it was a real interesting time for bob to be able to leave duke and come over and be around his daughter while she was going to school and then and then helping with the team and we we had an office together for 10 years together we sat across from each other and i don't remember us ever having a crossword with each other in those 10 years, the most loyal guy, the most honorable guy, uh, a fierce competitor still. He still got angry, you know, when guys didn't do what they, he wanted to do, but he was, he was all in. I mean, he was just a great person to be around. Uh, and uh, we talked Kevin O'Shea into coming with us as our director of operations. He was one, he was a uh, high performance coach at the USDA at that time in Texas. And the three of us came over in the fall of 2006 together. And then Bob stayed for 10 years and retired. And then Kevin moved into uh, Bob's role. But Bob had such bigger than life, you know, all the players, you know, adored him. 
you know, still keep up with him. And, you know, just, just a great, a great person. You know, one of those magnetic people that everybody wants to be around and, and uh, has a lot, very, very, very smart guy. Uh, just uh, uh, a super person to be around. It was a, like I said, God's always taking care of me. And, and there was another uh, example of that and get to work with Bob to Disney. Oh, that's great. Uh, Brandon, why don't you ask a question or two and we'll wrap it up here, Steve. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to come back to recruiting a little bit. Um, and you're sure. yourself playing multiple sports growing up, getting to be number 11 in the world singles, number two in the world of doubles. Um, I know the times have changed. Uh, are you still finding that you, you have some recruits who have that multi-sport background? Is that, is that even, even a situation that's occurring? I mean, is it occurring more? And if it does, is it occurring more with uh, maybe the European or international players you recruit? Um, you could talk a little more about the multi-sport athletics and uh, the recruiting side of that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good question. You know, with four and a half scholarships, in the old days with eight scholarships, you could take a project, you know, that was an athlete with four and a half scholarships. You really can't afford to make a mistake. And I think players have, have specialized earlier, maybe to their detriment, uh, too much, uh, too early, but that's just the world we live in. Mm. But I can tell you that Arthur Rinderneff, who played for me, who's having some success out there on the tour, a big six, five athlete. You know, he played a lot of soccer when he was a kid, and other sports, and uh, and so I, it's still out there. You know, I think I think most of your South American and European players, their first love is uh, soccer mm. or, their, or their football, and if they can't make it at that, then tennis is the second option. And I I would imagine that many of those young players, the what I call the freaks of the world, uh, that don't need to go to college that the centers and the sits the bosses and the, the dolls and the fetters and all those types. I would imagine if you look very closely with them that at a young age, they played, you know, some other sport and likely a lot of them played soccer. I know Johan Creek played rugby when he was a kid. That was back in my day. And mm-hmm. Kevin Curran played cricket. He was a very good cricket player. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, and almost a scratch golfer now, which a lot of you know tennis players pick that up later as a relaxation and something they really enjoy uh, going around and playing. But I, I think that with uh, the amount of scholarship and just it seems like in the U.S., I don't think we see too many multi-sport athletes like we did once before. Uh, I just I, I don't see it as much. Uh, and as a result, uh, I don't necessarily think they're quite as good athletes uh, in some respects. Uh, but you know, in other respects, because they're they've hit some more, so many more tennis balls, they're way further along than we were uh, when we were eighteen or nineteen years old. Mm. Just uh, you know, I I kind of laugh about it now, but I would have starved being a tennis player in the in the world that we live in right now. I mean, just how good are these guys that are on tour uh, that play at the level that they're able to play? Mm. Whether they come in or not, that's another story. But just how well do they hit the ball? I mean, they hit the ball a ton. Uh, they uh, they can play. It seems like they can play, like, you know, forever and mm-hmm. be able to recover and play the next day again or two days later. Just how great are these guys and the level? I, when I first saw Federer play in person, and I've seen a lot of tennis players in my lifetime, I said, I, I saw him at the at the Masters at Houston, and I'd already kind of, you know, was a teaching pro type. I said, I've never seen anybody hit a tennis ball like that before. Mm-hmm. And, and have all the different shots and be so graceful in all of them. I just, I've never seen anybody like that in my life. Uh, Steve, one question I have is uh, U.S. tennis. Um, you know, I'd say the bulk of our work, uh, the lane that we're in is, you know, really working with players that should be in a pre-academy, not an academy. Kids that uh, 
you know, in those early years. Um, I, you know, I know you know Dave Anderson well. I think his theme, uh, tennis needs to go back to the future. And, you know, someone like yourself who could play singles, doubles all over the court, different surfaces. And I know you. we've talked about this many times. You see so many lost arts. Uh, you know, another serve and volley, serve and volley and doubles, approach volleys, approach shots. I mean, sometimes you go to a tournament now and young kids aren't even taking volleys in the warm-up. Well, what do you think needs to be done? Um, I mean, I think that a lot of times when a young kid gets to college, I feel sorry for the college coaches because they've had no doubles training and they've got such bad grips. Um, but if you were just say a few things to help tennis, help tennis in America, what would they be? Well, I, I, it would be great for them to emphasize the doubles and the juniors more. Obviously, that makes them, you know, hopefully makes them come forward and that the coaches see the importance of still being able to serve in volley uh, and come in and learn that part of the game. Um, I think uh, uh, that that would really help. Um, I was talking to Guy Fritz yesterday, uh, you know, kind of congratulating on Taylor's uh, big win you know, in Indian Wells winning his first thousand series tournament. And he even lamented to me, he said, but he still can't hit a backhand volley. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, here's a guy that, you know, one of the best players in the world. And he's really good off, has a great serve. He's got, he's really good off the ground on both sides. But, you know, uh, you look at guys like Nadal, as Nadal's gotten older, what has he done? You know, I mean, he's pretty accomplished volleyer now. Well, he didn't have that early on in his career. He kept working on his game and trying to add things to it to make him a, a tougher out and be able to play on all surfaces. And as he's gotten older, he realizes maybe he can't play 30 and 40 shot rallies anymore. His body just can't handle that. He can handle it for one match, but not for seven. And so I, I think that, uh, I'm trying to go back to your question, I, I think that uh, coaches, young coaches, or coaches of young players, need to emphasize uh, that part of the game so that if you introduce it to them at an early age, they're not afraid of the net. They're, you know, they may get passed or whatever, but I think I've heard you say this before, Steve, that, you know, winning is confusing uh, and that there's got to be ways for us to encourage these young players to want to not just be a one-dimensional player, but be an all-court player. And and I, I kind of talk with my guys, how I've sold it with my guys is, your doubles is an insurance policy to make the circuit. I got a lot of guys out playing doubles right now on the tour that are making money. And some guys playing singles as well. Uh, but that doubles is not only an insurance policy for them, but to, to get, give themselves to go chance to play, but it also makes you a better singles player as well to be able to play the whole court and, uh, you know, put other players in bad positions in the court and, you know, attack uh, attack a lot. You know, and i give you the prime example of a college player that's doing pretty well out there on the tour right now is this Maxime Cressy who played four for UCLA. And now he's having success because he's playing differently than everybody else. And he's attacking like crazy. And he drove Medvedev. Uh, he uh, he drove drove uh, the Russian to death crazy at, at uh, the Australian Open. Here he was standing really far back, and he couldn't break the guy's serve. So it still worked. You know, Chris, he, players- he spent a few weeks at our place and when we were up in Orlando. But, you know, his, his mother is American. His father's French. Like, I think I've got that right. Could be vice versa. I think the mother's the one who was a volleyball player at USC. But uh, Matt Clore worked with him. Andy Fitzell did a short stint uh, traveling with him. Um, Jason Chung came by to say hello. And, and uh, we we're just talking about how he serves in volleys. And he goes, well, he has such a big serve. And I, I'm repeating myself from a previous podcast. And I said to Jason, I said, I wish you wouldn't have said that because uh, – you, you've got to go to the net. It's like Dick Gould said, I don't care how you get there. you got to get there twice a game. Uh, right. Matt Clore has a, a note written by Federer to uh, Mackenzie McDonald, and it basically, of course, it's leading into the grass season, but he says uh, the same thing. I don't care how you get there. you got to get there twice a game. But well, no, I, somebody, Go ahead. Some, you know, some players can be serving volleyers and others can be 
volley servers. You know, I mean, their volley is so good, they can still get in there, or they can hit approach shots and still get in there. And so there's lots of ways to get in. You know, I mean, just just the fact that a guy has a big forehand, and if he, I think part of it, Steve, is that players are playing a little too far back in the court, and when they do hit a shot, they don't fill in the space and get back closer to the baseline so that they could, when they do hurt the other player, they could come take that next ball out of the air, but because they're standing far enough back, they can't really take advantage of it, and uh, I think that's part of it. So the positioning part of it could be uh, a major component of getting players to play, you know, play up closer to the baseline and and take them the balls early and then follow it and get it out of the air uh, when they've hurt their opponents way more than they should. I also think that uh, that you know playing down the center some obviously is a good play as well to. Uh, you have no lanes to pass, really. So, you know, guys can come in in a lot of different ways there that that they don't utilize like they should. Um, and I, I think that that's obviously underutilized. Um, but but you're right. I think younger players, I, I wish there was a way to fix the court in such a way that you got more points if you wanted at the net. <laughs> Maybe our scoring you know, especially for little kids, uh, you maybe give them three points for, mm. um, you know, being up in the front court, win, winning a shot yeah. where you hit it out of the winning, air, volley or an overhead. Yeah, winning it with an approach, volley or overhead, I think that would be really – and then obviously playing a bunch of doubles, I think that – and the kids like the doubles. It's fun. They get to play with their with their friends. And so uh, – but kind of make it almost mandatory that they gotta that they've got to come forward. As one thing, um, a side note with the UTR where you can charge whatever you want for an entry fee. Um, sometimes they're charging the same for doubles and it's just too expensive. But I, I remember Rob and Sherry, Austin Krychek, um, you know, recommending you for many, many reasons. But one of them was, so as a lefty, Austin, we go to, go to the net more. Because so many players are, are not going forward. It's amazing. So it's... Uh... It's kind of a lost art, unfortunately. Uh, you know, and, and I'll be the first to admit that the string and the rackets has made it more difficult uh, just because there can be so much more spin created on the ball. It is more difficult. There's no question, but it still is a very viable part of, the, of, of tennis that I think people can take advantage of. Um, way more than obviously they do. Yeah. Um, Especially in doubles. So, mm. I read where yeah. Federer said that, you know, the players just fear the low volley. Um, but Steve, yeah. it's been great to have you. I'll we'll have to have you again. I know you got to get off and get on with a recruit. Anything else, Brandon? I've got one very, very quick question. Um, we have in our notes, maybe we talked about this, that your serve uh, when you played, I think the fastest was 138. Is that is that accurate? I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, Suppose if I, I hit one one fifty four at a exhibition in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, Jack Timer had some tournaments, and Jimmy Connors played, and I played at the uh, in Tulsa way back when. But it couldn't be calibrated at that time. So the following week, uh, it set it on a gun. So that wasn't you know now they have the machines and stuff. Yeah. So next week they tried to see if I could break it, and that's where the 138 came in. Gotcha. Yeah, we've, um, you know, the body rotation, the low, the low toss, way out in front, the loose service action. If we, if we were to slap a Babolat racket in your hand, <laughs> I know you very hum- humbly said uh, that the players today are are stronger than than say when you were on the tour. But um, what do you think you'd be clocking at with one of those blue Babolats? Well, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be one thirty-eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's. Uh, but I, is, is this a is this a scientific fact? I've heard this before, and I'd like. I mean, you guys are, you know, more scientific than I. Uh, I had heard that if you shot a tennis ball out of a cannon, 
because of the texture of the ball that it could only go 163 miles an hour. Is that true? I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've heard that too, but is that true? Actually, uh, uh, Mike McLaughlin, who we've had on, uh, he's, we've got a green light from Gideon Ariel, uh, Vic Braden's, uh, you know, one of Vic Braden's mentors. Um, you know, they had the Kodo Research Center. So we'll have to, we'll have to ask Gideon that question. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know that because I heard that one time and I thought, hmm, that's, uh, that's pretty fast. So does that mean that no one can ever you know, the Sam Gross of the world or whomever can only go, you know, up to that speed, that's it. Well, there's so many factors. I heard that with an ice hockey puck that if it goes 163, the goalie won't be able to react, but it depends on where it's coming from at 163. Um, you sure. Know, where, where, but, but tennis is more set where people are serving from, you know, 60 feet away to the service line, 78 feet sure. baseline to baseline. But uh, no, I don't know the answer to that, but there's... Uh, Certainly a lot of variables. Uh, I do think that uh, there's room for argument. I've heard many things. Uh, I, I don't think a player like yourself would have voted for this years ago, but that, uh, you know, based on your height, you got to move a few inches behind the baseline. This is where the people, <laughs> this is where the people that are six, you know, so you got to have Isner serve from the fence. Um, right. But, That's right. Um, get a distance, then he, he'd be so spread out that, you know, obviously a guy like that size is not going to be very good in the corners, and the further back he is to serve, I mean, he'd, he'd re- he would really be up a creek. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> hey, i got to run. Yeah, of course. I was just going to say with the serve, um, the other thing, too, is that, like, they have in baseball where, you know, like Texas A&M, you're, you're in the metal bats, but not in pro baseball. Maybe they should modify the racket. Maybe. But we'll bring that up another time, Steve. But thanks again. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, nice, guys. Nice I enjoyed, enjoyed it. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. Flanagan, Flanagan, Flanagan. So many great stories. I know the one that you had told me, uh, in my introduction to Steve Denton years ago, was the, the, the double story against Agassi and Crickstein. Yeah. We didn't get around to that one, but that's a good one. I believe it was Agassi. Where they were young teenagers on it coming up, and you know, also to the the, the game of intimidation, um, where I think Agassi was the one who threw it way over his head. He never really did have a great first serve, so he serves and stays back. And it's already it's they're playing; they're not warming up. So Agassi serves and stays back, and Steve just catches the ball and goes, "Really? Uh, like, like, fellas, you don't, you're not going to play that way?" Yeah. Uh, there's so many great stories. Uh, Ted Schroeder, like Chuck McKinley, played Wimbledon, won it his first time. Junior comes on the scene, and he tosses it way over his head. It's amazing how many juniors toss, say a righty, they toss so far left. Mm-hmm. And it's, they're not really doing anything with the serve, but because they get to toss so far over their head, the racket's going up, and the trajectory is what makes the ball bounce high. There's no speed on the ball. So Braden used to always tell the story. So Hotshot Junior comes up, and he's you know, bending his back. He's doing the limbo. He's got the toss way left. And Chuck McKinley used to do this all the time. But Ted Schroeder, he got down on the return of serve, got down on one knee and cracked an overhead. And he said, hey, kid, you can't serve that way up here. <laughs> so, um, you know, I um, remember having my son Connor, a girl who, uh, you know, played a high level in, in college tennis. We trying to play pro tennis, tossed about way overhead. And, uh, you know, Connor was maybe 12 years old. I said, hey, Connor, care for a minute. I said, see if you can stand in the service box and catch your serve. You know, because so, a lot of times they just don't realize there's so little speed. Mm. And, but the kick serve is going to work at an intermediate level because you're playing an intermediate. Right. And they let the ball get way above their shoulder. They don't play it on the rise. And they don't, they don't, they don't take advantage of, uh, and it's an optical illusion too. It's like the airplane floating off in the distance. It looks like it's going very slow. So the higher lob is, that's where one of the reasons people move back so slow on a lob. Mm. But yeah, they say, you know, anytime someone's really tossing way over their head, they step in and it's like um, Vicky Duval. I remember at one point you were going to coach her and she worked with us. I worked with her brother, Cedric, and Vicky on her own said, hey, I need to go work on my strokes. And it was really her serve, among other things, but her serve. And she wanted to play US Open. I said, you need to just play the 18s. And she won the 18s. But she was playing Stam Stozer, who's obviously a great athlete, big, strong. She won the US Open. But 
I mean, she just, she had a kick serve, but she tossed it so far overhead. And, you know, a lot of the players wouldn't take advantage of that. Mm. They've got to step in. But if they're, they're always playing so far back, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to say, well, why don't you, why don't you step in and play it early? But, you know, well, I've been playing for 12, 13, 14 years, and I've never done that. Yeah. But, yeah, there, with Steve Denton, uh, there's so many things we could get into with, uh, but, no, very humble. Uh, it's amazing that, to just listen to Steve uh, relate tennis to the Bible. But um, first time I flew to Corpus Christi to work with him, I never saw a tennis court. I was just in his living room and he'd ask a question and answer. Then I would show back in the day, I showed up with a shoulder bag of VHS, VHS tapes. And then I remember uh, his wife uh, had been listening and she made sandwiches. She said, well, let's make Steve feel better. Um, because he was just saying, I don't know that. I don't know that. And that's where I think most touring pros, that, when I say touring pros, people who made money. Like I remember Stan Smith and Arthur Ashe spending time with Vic and both Stan and Arthur going, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Just over and over again. But so anyway, um, Steve's wife put in a tape. It was a match where he was beating McEnroe. <laughs> I said, well, let Steve feel good about himself at this point. But um, I do think that touring pros that are, you know, the, the money winners are more, um, you know, happy in their own skin. And they, but I think sometimes the, the ones that are struggling, um, you know, the, somebody's been, you know, Brady used to say, if you've been playing the futures for three years, there's no future. And um, yeah, there's just too many times, there's too many arguments. But, right. but, um, but Steve, I think also too, that, um, had an appreciation for the fact that we were developing in this, you know, small city, but a, a small program. You know, we always say less than a dozen kids, and our students were winning all these high school state championships. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, I was telling a story yesterday. This Japanese players here. We have two players from Japan, and Maru Yamohiro Michi-san. He's coached the, the the famous wheelchair tennis player for a long, long time. So I was in Japan lecturing in five cities, all day lecture, four of them at two days, eight and eight, eight hours. And um, Kazuko Swamatsu, her father, so this gentleman, um, his daughter, world-class player, you know, won a Grand Slam title, was in the semis of the Grand Slam singles. And then his granddaughter were both world-class tennis players. Granddaughter is top 50. I'll never forget, she came to listen to four hours and she had to come back and re- re- apologize to me the next day because she skipped the afternoon session. You know, the level of, of respect in the Japanese society compared to, say, ours. My opinion, it's quite different. So um, I go to the Japanese tennis center with the famous father of Japanese tennis. And we have a translator and I go, everybody knows you. And he puts his thumb to his chin. He goes, yes, famous face in Japan. So I asked the translator, and I said, you know, I've been talking for eight hours, and what he just said is so much better than what I just said. I said, how do you develop players? It was just classic. He said, easy, basics, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. And it was like, that's how I'm going to start giving seminars. Mm. So I would just say that in the first 30 seconds and say, okay, let's go have some fun. <laughs> but that's what, it, that's what it really is. Right. But no, I think with Steve, uh, it's been great to know him over all these years, and uh, he's somebody who uh, really understands the, you know, the, the game backwards and forwards. And uh, but I think he also too, having been a teaching pro, and you know, knowing uh, it's not so easy to get someone to win a high school state championship. Mm-hmm. You know, it comes back to the Braden thing, you know, where maybe you're working with a kid who puts the ice cream cone on their forehead. Um, you know, to take well, we're taking C athletes and making A players. There's some. Re- programs are based on recruiting college tennis would be one of them or say a federation where they're taking a athletes and making C players, mm. but it is basics, 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 repeat, repeat, repeat. But no, the stories um, with, uh, you know, I'd like the one where he talks about you know, how he's playing mixed doubles with Billie Jean King and, you know, got, got the dirtiest look ever because he had a break point. Yeah. But uh, no, if, to come into the game, he's four, as I started, he's four years younger than, than Connor. So, born the same year as Borg. So he was part of that golden era. But then also the legends of their game were, were 
you know, on the way out on the tour when he was on his way in. But I hope the listeners got a lot out of that. Yeah, it was, it was good, excellent. Good fun. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks for listening. Podcast number 85 in the books. 85. Thanks, Steve Denton. Thanks for listening, everyone. Adios, amigos.